All right, so as I mentioned today, we start chapter two. Now we finally get to, what I feel like is we finally get to talk about chemistry. Not that what we did in first chapter wasn't chemistry. That was just kind of getting our feet wet in looking at the type of uh, values that we're going to be uh, using in this class. Here we finally get to start talking about something that we would say is chemistry related. So in chapter two, we're looking at atoms, molecules, and ions. You can tell me what an ion is. Anybody remember what an ion is? An ion is a charged um, atom. It could be negative or positively charged. Okay, And depending on what type of element you are will essentially determine what type of charge you're going to have. So in this chapter, we're going to be learning about how the position of elements on the periodic table affect the overall charge for the majority of the atoms and how those atoms then can come together and form compounds or molecules, okay? But <clears throat> way back, actually, when you say way back, it's actually not too terribly way back in terms of uh, history, but we're looking at early 1800s-ish, okay? We had a gentleman by the name of Dalton. Dalton did quite an extensive um, research on the atom for basically what they knew or thought of was the atom. Okay. And so as Dalton kind of came up with these ideas and his research and his studies started showing some common um, themes here, he came up with the atomic theory of matter. So we know that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, okay? We are all pieces of matter, okay? But in terms of the atomic theory of matter, he states that the theory that atoms are the fundamental building blocks of matter reemerged in the early 19th century, championed by this guy named John Dalton, okay? So there was an idea a long time ago about these atoms. In fact, I believe the word atom comes from uh, the Greek word atomos, okay? So the early Greeks even started thinking about there was something smaller out there. But it kind of went away. And then early in the 1800s, John Dalton came, brought it back to the front uh, burner, and really utilized the idea of an atom being the building block as his basis, okay? He came up with these four postulates, okay, for as part of his theory. Put us when we start talking about these four postulates here in just a moment. Put stars next to each one, because you will need to know his four postulates, okay. If you or if you want to highlight, whatever, okay. But the four postulates are going to be necessary for you to know. So the very first one is that each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. There, number one, everything is made up of atoms. So when we say each element, well, basically, the whole nature is made up of elements. So that means everything is made up of atoms. Number two, all atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. Okay. So yes, the atom of one is different than others in other elements. Basically saying that each element has its unique identity. Okay, just like you have your own unique identity, atoms are the same way. Okay. Um, but one thing that you need to also keep in mind is I have these two little asterisks here, and then down here in old little letter uh, typing, I have isotopes. Okay. 
Let me know what an isotope is. We're going to learn about it here in the first few sections. But an isotope is an atom that might have a varying mass between atoms of the same element. So one atom of, let's say, chlorine might have a slightly different mass than another atom of chlorine. Okay? And the difference in mass comes from the difference in neutrons. Why is it the difference in the number of neutrons and not protons? What happens if we change the number of protons? Well, it becomes positive, but what else? And this is where it gets really interesting. I'm actually glad that you didn't have a correct answer, uh, an answer that I was looking for there. Because this is what always intrigues me. Come over here to the periodic table. What are those called? You know what? I guess I ought to do this on the, the camera so everyone can see if I can find. Uh, uh. Okay, need my own studio, kids. Can you all not quite see that. There we go. Why is this like that? There we go. Oh, my gosh. What is... This called right here. What is this group of elements known as? Noble. noble gases. Okay. What's special about noble gases? They were one of the last ones to be discovered. Why is that? They're the last to be discovered because they are extremely non reactive. Okay. They're very stable, okay? They have what we call a full outer shell of electron, of valence electrons. So <clears throat> they don't like to react to anybody. That's why they were one of the last ones to be found because they based a lot of our, their discoveries off of reactions, okay? Now, argon, for instance, <clears throat> has an atomic number of 18. The atomic number also equals the uh, number of protons in an atom. Okay, so argon means it has 18 protons. Let's add one more proton, okay? Giving us an atomic number of 19. Which gives us potassium. Okay, again, argon, noble gas, add one proton, you get potassium which is a metal. Not only is it a metal, it is a highly reactive metal. So reactive that in nature it is usually never found by itself. It's usually always in a compound. Because even if there's any moisture in the air or any, any exposure to water, it becomes highly um, combustible, if you will. In fact, that's what we do in Chapter 5. I've got some pieces of um, lithium, sodium, and... I have potassium. I can't remember. I, I don't think I have potassium, unfortunately. Um, but we place it in water and we get to see what happens. It, it's actually pretty, pretty cool. Um, but again, the reason why going back to isotopes, the reason why we change the number of neutrons instead of electron or protons is because if we were to change the number of protons, we would change the entire identity of the atom itself. So, we don't do that. Anyway, the reason why I have this asterisk here is because we do, each element do have um, atoms that do vary in mass. Okay? Again, this was back in the early 1800s. The concept of isotopes was not really brought about or thought of or even known about until about 1913. 
So about 100 years after the after Dalton's postulates. Okay. So his second postulate's a little can be maybe updated a little bit. Okay. Yeah, they still you know, an atom of an element is going to be different than an atom of another element. But now we know that there are going to be uh, atoms of a single element that might vary in overall mass. And the number that you see that's got the decimal values on periodic table, those are um, what we call, they're averages. Okay. They are averages of all the isotopes and their percentages found amongst um, nature. It's actually what we get to do in here, I believe, this chapter. We get to calculate atomic weights. We get to determine based off of per, uh, percent abundance of particular isotopes. Um, and then we should have sim uh, similar numbers to what we see on the periodic table. Third postulate, atoms of an element are not changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. That last statement right there. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. Basically what this is saying is during a, a basic chemical reaction, you cannot have atoms of sulfur be changed into another uh, atom of another element. Okay. They're going to always exist. What's there is there. You can't change it. Of course, that's before we started understanding radioactivity. But again, we're talking chemical reactions. Okay. There's a difference. And number four. Compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combine. A given compound always has the same relative number and kind of atoms. For instance, water. What is water's chemical formula? H2O. Very good. If I were to go to this faucet, turn it on, collect a sample of water, and determine that its chemical formula is H2O. And then I went and took a sample of water. Ooh! That's not good. <laughs> a sample of water um, from Florida. It's one of my favorite all-time places ever. Um, what would its chemical makeup be? H2O. The water is always going to have that chemical makeup of H2O. It's always going to have that ratio of two hydrogens to one oxygen. Okay? So when we have chemicals of something specific, it will always have that chemical makeup and ratio. Okay? <clears throat> then once we start talking about Dalton's, we talk about the law of conservation of mass. Basically... Um, states that the total mass of substances present at the end of a chemical process is the same as the mass of substances present before the process took place. So what you had in the beginning, the total mass of substances that you had in the beginning is going to endure a chemical process, but after that chemical process, the same total mass has to be present, has to exist. Okay? You have to have, at the, in the end, what you had in the beginning. Now, it may be different forms, but you still are going to have the same mass. Again, you could go back to the whole idea of, you know, baking a cake. Put all your ingredients in, mix them up, put it into a pan. Put it in the oven. The oven kickstarts a chemical reaction. You end up with a cake. Okay? But the cake itself might be a little lighter than what you started with. So how does that fit the law of conservation of mass? Well, most likely... 
what happened was any liquid that was in the initial mixture evaporated out. And that mass of the evaporated liquid, which went into the oven and ultimately the uh, surrounding atmosphere, that mass is going to equal that missing mass from the cake. You with me on that one? Just meaning that, yeah, it may not be in the cake directly, but that missing mass didn't get destroyed. It just kind of changed form. Okay. Now let's start talking about the atom itself. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the understanding of the atom in terms of history is pretty much the, like a blink of an eye. Okay. A lot of this happened fairly recently in terms of scientific knowledge. Okay. Looking at the atom here, we have the electron. Poor little electron always gets shunned, always gets looked over. But as we're going to find out over the next handful of chapters, possibly one of the most important um, particles that we can have. Okay. Anyway, the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson is a very important name in terms of the history of the atom. He discovered the electron in 1897 using an experiment just like this. Okay, he had an anode and a cathode connected to some electricity. He had a glass screen in here. Um, and basically, excuse me, basically what he found was when he set this stream of particles uh, through here, he was able to deflect that string of particles towards a magnet. Not only was it deflected towards the magnet, but it was deflected towards the positive end of the magnet, meaning that whatever particle it was had to have a charge that was negative. So <clears throat> that was how we discovered the electron. Again, 1897, that was one of the first particles that was discovered. So what, 123 years ago? How long has science been a big part of the world? This is very recent in terms of that. <clears throat> anyway, he went on to measure the charge mass ratio of the electron to be 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. Okay, and it's not really... This isn't necessarily of importance to us in here. Some people find it important. Though. Another thing that we don't really talk about a whole lot is the milk and oil uh, drop experiment. And really all this was by uh, is a study by Robert Milliken. Uh, again, once uh, Thompson discovered the charge mass ratio, um, they kind of just determined whether or not if the charge would also affect the mass and the mass would affect the charge, yada, yada, yada. I did this by dropping small itty bitty oil droplets down into this um, little um, contraption here where x-rays took pictures. And yeah, it was um, basically determined what the charge was by Robert Milken in 1909 from the University of Chicago. A lot of big things based around the atomic um concepts came from the university of chicago this is one of the major players in the manhattan project what's the manhattan project atomic bombs mm -hmm. think of atomic bombs we have radioactivity and it's a spontaneous emission of radiation by an atom first observed by henry Becquerel and really pioneered by Marie and Pierre Curie, okay? But unfortunately, a lot of times when you are the pioneer and early study studiers of something, a lot of times things can happen because we just didn't know. Um, I know Marie Curie, uh, she ended up having some really bad health ailments because of her work. 
uh, with radioactivity. Because again, it was not known what the health effects were when they first started studying this. But um, without her knowledge, we would have been so far behind that the world could be different today. So we actually owe a lot to them uh, for our knowledge and our understanding of this. In fact, going back to this with our the idea of um, not knowing much about radioactivity, um, old um, airplane, the military airplanes, okay? They didn't really have the, the lighting and instrumentation panels that current aircraft have. So in order to be able to conduct certain uh, nighttime um, tactics and still be able to see their uh, instrumentation, they couldn't have lights on. So what they did was they would have their gauges and dials um, painted with radioactive paint, basically, that would glow in the dark. Well, if you know anything about gauges, you know, if you look at your car gauge, okay, gauge in your car, they have a really thin indicator on there, right? Well, you had to have a really fine hand and fine paintbrush to paint those, okay, a certain way. Well, how do you think a lot of people would get a small paintbrush? How would you get it to a fine point? How would you make a fine point on a little on a little paintbrush? Have you ever seen people where they use their lips to spin it around and get a really fine point? Well, that's what these people were doing while they were painting radioactive paint onto the dials. How many people do you think fell ill after this many days and years of this process? Almost all of them. There's actually a short book uh, talking about that. It's actually kind of a fascinating one. It's been maybe 14 years since I read it, but it, was, it talks about that, the uh, radioactive dial workers that would use their their mouths to create a fine point so they get a really fine line on there, of course, with some pretty uh, horrible consequences. Anyway, when are we going to talk about radioactivity? The three types of radiation. Rutherford, big player in uh, the idea of radioactivity. In fact, we study him more in this book than we do the Curies, at least in what we call Okay. Anyway, Rutherford discovered these three types of radiation. We got alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Okay. Alpha, beta, gamma. Who made gamma radiation popular? He helped save the end game. Hulk. Yes. Hulk was exposed to or Dr. Banner, I should say, was exposed to extreme levels of gamma radiation. That's how he became the Hulk. I don't recommend you doing this, though. Anyway, he did these experiments and found that these different um, types of radiation had different charges. So what he did was he had a lead block, because lead helps to um, prevent any radiation from going out into the open. Inside that lead block, Radioactive substance had a hole right here. That hole is the only place where the particles could escape. And then he had in here two plates, positive, negative. And these, those plates were charged with those specific charges. And he found that at, he had this photographic plate that would detect the radiation as it uh, came into contact with it. He found that certain rays were deflected towards the positive plate, certain rays were deflected towards the negative plate, and other rays just went straight through without even having a care in the world. He found out that the beta particles were the ones that had the negative charge, the alpha, the positive charge, and the gamma, no charge. So yes, it looks like a very simple setup. There's more. There's a little more to it. But you get the idea. And so, we then come to our development and our ideas about 
what these atoms look like. Okay, around 1900. So again, the idea of atoms making up everything about 100 years ago or so from this time point. We have these models, okay? And the prevailing one, the one that was accepted at the time was called the plum pudding model. Now, I don't know how popular plum pudding is these days. It must have been pretty popular back then. But J.J. Thompson again, here he is. Mr. Discovered the Electron. Put his two cents in, help us give us an idea about the model of an atom. So what his model was, was that he had the sphere sphere uh that was positively charged and that all kind of sprinkled throughout were these negatively charged electrons notice there's no even mention of neutrons kind of goes back to the idea again that well, neutrons being neutral they really don't react to anything much like the noble gases so they'll be discovered later on so even though we know that this is not what we accept now, it at least gave us an idea, okay? Which is the premise of science. You get early ideas, get early models. Technology advances, which is advances the knowledge base. And then our knowledge base can in turn impact our technology. Big cycle. Eventually, we typically always advance and accept newer, more specific, more understood models. And that's what happens with the atom. Because here comes Rutherford to help disprove uh, Thompson's model. And you will want to star highlight slide 15. Because this is what's called the gold foil experiment. Okay, the gold foil experiment. What Rutherford did? Again, he's already he's already found these three different particles of radioactive materials. He then went and set up this experiment. He had a very thin sheet, very thin sheet of gold foil, and surrounding the entire piece of gold foil was this um, fluorescent screen that would detect any time a particle hit it, it would fluoresce. And again, much like his uh, previous example, he had a radioactive material of uh, consisting of alpha particles in this uh, lead block. And those alpha particles, when uh, basically shot out, quote unquote shot out appropriately through that hole, would come into contact with that piece of gold foil and then they would look at the results. What they found was that most particles, most alpha particles, went right through that gold foil and were detected almost directly in a straight line from its source. They just passed on through. But then you get into ones like this. Okay, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. Extremely sharp angles. In fact, some even bounce straight back from or towards the source. So here we have the majority of them going through, but then we have some that are just smacking into something, causing a huge change or huge shift in their path. So what this kind of led rutherford to hypothesize was because of these large deflections that some of these particles took thompson's model could not be correct something had to be present that was dense enough to cause these change of direction so what he said was i love the word postulated was that dense nucleus with electrons around the outside of the atoms and that most of the volume of space in an atom is just that space 
empty. In fact, um, when we say a very small, dense nucleus, if we were to take the nucleus of an atom and blow it up, say to the size of a golf ball, and do, do you know, have you ever heard, you know, Michigan University, the Wolverines? Well, they have like one of the biggest football stadiums out there. It holds over 100,000 spectators, not including everybody else. Huge stadium. Okay. If you were to take that golf ball, place it at the 50 yard line, the entire stadium would be the empty space of an atom. So that's how small the nucleus is in comparison to the rest of an atom. But it carries a lot of weight, a lot of density. So Rutherford wasn't done making all these discoveries, you know, radioactive particles, the idea of a nucleus, a new model of an atom. He went on to discover the fact that, oh, we got protons. Because let's think about it. Protons are positive. So alpha particles are positive. What happens... When two things with similar charges come near each other, what do they do? They repel, right? And then some guy by the name of James Chadwick came along in 1932 and discovered neutrons. So here we go from late 1890s all the way to 1919. Almost 20 years before we discovered a second particle. And then another what, 13 years to discover the third and final main particle. So, I mean, 30-ish years, I mean, it seems like a lot, but it's not, because you got to think about it. At the time, technology just wasn't what it is today, obviously. Okay? Um, <clears throat> what we'll do to finish this off is... Actually, nothing, because we've only got two minutes. So, um, tomorrow, um, expect a video to have us pick up when we actually start looking at atomic size. It's pretty interesting to really put figures to it, numbers. Okay? So, that is where we will start off tomorrow. I am going to stop my recording.